This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us for World AIDS Day Worldwide, an international broadcast in the lead up to AIDS 2014, the 20th International AIDS Conference, bringing together the best minds working in the field of HIV. That's researchers, policymakers, people living with HIV, and others committed to ending this epidemic. Melbourne will host the conference from 20 to 25 July next year, 2014. The theme that we're exploring in this session is stepping up the pace. In fact, that's the overall theme for the conference next year. Now, earlier this morning, Kate looked at stepping up the pace for a cure. This hour, we'll be looking at stepping up the pace, particularly with the devastating HIV co-infection of tuberculosis. You can join in the global conversation by emailing us. That's onair at joy.org.au. And you can also send your Twitter, you tweet to hashtag joywad. Now, sadly, HIV and tuberculosis are yin and yang. They are distressingly intertwined. Infection with HIV is the most powerful known risk factor uh, predeposing TB infection, and TB is the most common cause of AIDS-related death. TB is actually curable for most people, yet more than one million people die from TB, TB every year. To uncover the advances in science and initiatives relating to TB, we have some wonderful guests with us this hour. We'll be speaking or we'll be hearing from Bill Botel. He's the Executive Director of the Pacific Friends of the Global Fund. Joining us, us, joining us on Skype shortly during the hour will be Dr Peter Higgs from the National Drug Research Institute at Curtin University. And in the studio here, I have great pleasure in welcoming Professor Michael Kidd. He is the chair of the Government Ministerial Advisory Committee on Bloodborne Viruses and Sexually Transmitted Infections. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Matt. Great to be here. Look, tuberculosis, uh, Australia has a fairly low rate. In fact, it's not really on the radar. So I thought we might just sort of take a step back. And for, for people uh, listening and watching online, can you tell us, what tuberculosis is and what does it mean to a person who's infected with tuberculosis? Well, tuberculosis is, uh, you're quite right, is not a high uh, on the health agenda here in Australia at the moment, but globally it is a huge problem. About a third of the world's population are estimated to be uh, to have been exposed and infected by tuberculosis. Um, most of those people uh, have what we call latent infections, so they, they carry the infection but they're not actively uh, unwell with TB and they don't transmit TB to other people. But when people uh, get uh, compromise of their immune system, which of course happens with HIV but also occurs with other conditions as well, then the TB can become activated and people become really quite unwell. And, uh, and as you've said, it can be one of the most uh, common causes of death uh, for people with HIV. They actually die as a consequence of the tuberculosis. And uh, the way that tuberculosis is spread? Well, tuberculosis is spread by uh, respiratory means. So usually someone with TB has the TB in their lungs and they cough or they sneeze or they spit and, uh, and the, uh, the, the organism is, uh, is carried in the air and it's inhaled by someone else. Uh, TB is, uh, is a highly infectious disease. So uh, it, uh, it spreads uh, very quickly from people to people. Uh, and, uh, and it was previously a terrible scourge. Uh, you know, we, we read about um, the impact of, of TB, particularly in the, in the 1800s. One of the classic examples is the Bronte sisters, uh, the famous authors, and, uh, and all the girls uh, had TB and they all died uh, in their 20s and 30s uh, as a result of this terrible infection. And it was still a real problem uh, in Australia uh, coming into, the, uh, into last century. Uh, into the 1900s and uh, you know when I was growing up uh, in Australia in the 1960s we had uh, the chest x-ray bus which used to go around Melbourne the and chest uh, x-ray bus yep it'd sit in the shopping centres and everyone would get a letter and everyone would come and get a chest x-ray to make sure they didn't have uh, tuberculosis and if they had evidence of it then they'd be uh, treated for it uh, similarly when I was at school in, in the 60s uh, children were all uh, tested for TB. We had the skin test called the MAN2 test uh, and then we were all vaccinated with the, uh, the BCG uh, vaccine. Now that tended to phase out during the, uh, during the 70s and I think we probably all thought that TB had gone away in Australia. 
but uh, but with the advent of, of HIV in the 1980s, TB started to reappear. And, uh, and as you've said, the two diseases uh, go together in so many parts of the world. And it's still an important disease for countries like Australia. You know, there's still a risk that we could get serious spread of tuberculosis in Australia, and particularly the, uh, the multi-drug resistant strains of TB uh, cause a great deal of concern amongst public health of officials uh, in this country and around the world. But TB never went away from many uh, other parts of the world, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also many of uh, our near neighbour countries in Asia. Uh, TB is, is still present. Uh, it still affects large numbers of people, and, uh, and tragically, it still has uh, a terrible death rate. Now, we're going to explore all of those issues, particularly related to our own region of uh, Australia and the Pacific. And uh, perhaps you've got some memories of... of uh, tuberculosis and testing at schools and, and the bus, uh, you can tweet hashtag joywad or email on air at joy.org.au. We're going to hear now from Bill Botel. Now, Joy is Dean Beck caught up with Bill Botel, the Executive Director of the Pacific Friends of the Global Fund at the World AIDS Day activities at Federation Square and asked him a whole lot of questions about World AIDS Day and particularly about tuberculosis and its effect on our region. Bill Botel is the Executive Director of the Pacific Friends of the Global Fund. Bill, thank you very much for joining us on World AIDS Day. Hi. Bill, uh, the region itself, the uh, Asia-Pacific region, has its own challenges with regards to HIV and AIDS. What is unique to the area? Well, of course, the Pacific uh, has relatively a few number of people spread out over a sixth of the Earth's surface. So when you think of the small Pacific Island states, small populations uh, spread over many islands and many islands in each country. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, of course, it's a very difficult terrain, uh, bigger population, but still spread out over rural and regional areas that are really difficult to reach uh, for any primary health care service, much less making sure that everybody who needs it has got access to antiretroviral therapies. So small population, widely, dis widely spread out, and in many countries a very rudimentary primary health care service. The Global Fund itself, uh, and I know Papua New Guinea, has had quite a lot of philanthropic uh, donations and corporate donations, and really that's what the Global Fund set up to do, isn't it, to disperse that. Tell us about it. Yes, well, the Global Fund's a tremendous success story. Since it was set up in 2002 by the G8 group of countries, it's raised about $30 billion, mostly from uh, governments, but also from very big philanthropic donors, most notably, of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, that 30 billion, about half has gone to providing HIV treatment uh, in the poorest countries of the world, and some more goes to tuberculosis, which, of course, is uh, a co-problem uh, with a HIV. So it's, it's had new money, uh, together with the American uh, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which has uh, raised about 50 billion, five zero billion, this has made a tremendous difference to the number of people who are on antiretroviral therapy around the world. More people are on therapy, the less infectious each person is, and of course, therefore, the, uh, the, the new HIV caseload goes down. So we've had 20, 30% reduction in new HIV caseload in the world, not in every region, but in the world, uh, in the last 10 years, thanks to this money coming behind the right strategy and all the hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the world who are involved in care and treatment prevention uh, services. You, I know, have uh, said that the world has an AIDS issue, Australia has an HIV issue. Tell us what you mean by the difference in that. Well, of course, 30 years ago, when the problem first became obvious in Sydney and Melbourne and Australia, uh, people were becoming infected with HIV, mostly without knowing it, then developing uh, AIDS, becoming sick and dying median age of 10 months. So we had a real AIDS problem. We had hundreds of thousands uh, of young people, particularly young gay men, uh, being infected with this uh, disease and then dying. Now when treatments came online in, from 1996, slowly, not all at once, but slowly, everybody who had uh, the problem in Australia had access to treatments. Uh, the rate of deaths from AIDS declined dramatically and then the rates of new HIV infection, of course, fell very considerably. So we have a problem in Australia that is an HIV problem. People are on treatment, they have access, they live 
long and productive lives generally uh, and uh, we don't have that problem of deaths from AIDS broadly, although people still are dying of course at a, at a small level. Uh, in the rest of the world, uh, Central Asia, still in Sub-Saharan Africa, Russia and so on, there's a real AIDS problem. People don't have access to treatment. So they're getting sick and they're dying and they're uh, you know, their lives are very, uh, uh, very uh, sad and tragic. In the beginning of the epidemic, Australia's response was uh, world leading. Uh, we now see an ever increasing amount of uh, gay men uh, getting uh, HIV. And also worldwide, uh, the youth component is now about 50% of new infections. Uh, what's going on there? Well, the paradox of prevention is a real one. The more you prevent a problem uh, from developing or get rid of the problem as we more or less did in Australia. We don't have an AIDS problem, we have an HIV problem. It's very hard to tell each new generation of 15, 16 year old young people, particularly young gay boys, uh, don't uh, have unprotected sex. Uh, every parent knows the problems of convincing young people that you shouldn't have sex, do drugs, drive fast, uh, go bungee jumping and all the rest of it. So it is a problem. Uh, every, every generation has to be at least given the basic uh, information, the tools, uh, clean needles, syringes, condoms and so on, and made sure that they understand the nature of the risks and how they can best prevent themselves being infected and uh, passing on infection to their, to their partners. It won't work all the time, and the new rates are going up in Australia off a very low base, and I'm glad that governments, New South Wales, Victoria, other governments, are, try, are now trying to re refresh and renew their HIV prevention campaigns, reactivate the partnership, reach out again to young gay men, people at highest risk of HIV infection, and talk to them again, persuade people, and uh, give them all the tools and information they need to make a rational, informed decision. Uh, you don't want to get HIV, right? Given a, all things being equal, you'd rather not have it. So we, we've got to educate and inform, not just through great things like this uh, uh, and in venues and clubs and so on, but of course it just has to be a bigger, better uh, return to proper sex education, particularly for young gay boys, young gay men, uh, in schools. So all of this has to come together. Uh, it's uh, a really uh, a, a shocking abdication of responsibility on the part of schools and governments, uh, people who are responsible for these sort of things if they do not educate young people realistically and honestly about HIV infection, sex matters in relation to sexuality and, uh, and drugs. I know as a, an ambassador for the Enough Stigma campaign myself that stigma plays out in all sorts of ways with regards to uh, how community is affected by HIV. Do you think part of the lack of education is brought about by uh, the stigma that uh, HIV still has? Uh, yes, uh, I, it's a lot less than it was. Uh, I've been around long enough to know what it was really like when things were going very bad. And one of the things, uh, personally, I've always been astounded by was compared to the 1980s, or from the 1980s when we were facing this problem, you would never have thought that 20 and 30 years later, uh, community attitudes would have changed so much to uh, homosexuality, to gay people. I mean, really, when you look at support for things like gay marriage, uh, portrayal of gay people in television, movies, uh, uh, the normalization of it, it really is a tremendous change and not one that I ever thought would have taken place when we we're involved in the very darkest days of this where there was terrible discrimination not just amongst gay people but people who injected drugs, uh, sex workers and I, I still recall what it was like for people with haemophilia. Uh, it wasn't just the classically marginalised group, suddenly people with haemophilia were becoming very very uh, stigmatised and, uh, and cast out. So it's changed a lot in 30 years. I mean, uh, it's, it's an open point in all sorts of societies if you ever eradicate totally stigma and discrimination. But I, I think in Australia, the governments and the people reflect the will of the people and the attitudes of people. And I think generally people are supportive and have been supportive. Uh, Australian voters and taxpayers, governments of all parties have never stinted in the amount of money they have given for HIV care, treatment, 
prevention conducted through AIDS councils and uh, organisations and people like yourself and others who talk to the most at risk populations and of course in research, scientific research. Uh, I think Australia has done as well as anywhere in trying to tackle the underlying problems and I think that still shows up well in our, in our HIV infection rates. Here in Australia and seemingly uh, emergingly more often in uh, the UK and in the USA, we have a co-infection issue with hepatitis C. In this region though, on a broader scale, tuberculosis is the main uh, co-infection. Tell us about the focus of that as we head towards AIDS 2014, the conference here in Melbourne in next July. Yes, well, I think it is very important to understand the uh, slightly lateral and under, not well understood uh, threat that TB poses. Uh, it was one of those diseases that I think people just forgot about in, in much of the Western world and in Australia. But if you have 35 million people in the world living with HIV, hopefully one day all with access to treatment, of course they still have a very suppressed immune system. And things like TB, and goodness knows what else, but certainly TB loves that. They ju it just will move in. So the, a, a very good reason to prevent the spread of HIV, not just to treat it, is to reduce one by one the number of people with HIV and who are therefore not susceptible to TB. Now we know we've got a, an emerging long-term co-infection rate with TB and it is very important that money goes into the science and research around TB. Uh, of course it thrives in places in cities where there's close proximity or poor sanitation or otherwise poor health facilities so one thing leads to another and uh, TB is a symptom of other sorts of deprivation and, uh, and uh, overcrowding and lack of sanitation and so on. So all of those things have to be tackled as well. Um, it's no use, well, it's very useful to put money behind uh, treating people who are ill, but I'd rather go very strongly at the root causes. Lots and that's about infrastructure, really? It's about infrastructure and it's about making des decisions. I don't think the world needs one more nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. It certainly doesn't need a hundred more jet strike fighters. There are lots of things in the world that we can do without and should never have. And they cost billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, compared to which the cost of the tens of billions to get on top of things like HIV and TB is just a drop in the bucket. And uh, people have to come up against this too. There are things that we should not spend money on in the world. And there are things that we ought to do. And if we spend money on those things, the world will be a lot better, healthier, happier, and more secure place. Uh, so people who think about this have got to think about uh, the way in which we structure the, the spending we do in the world and stop spending on things that are endangering international public health and security. Bill Botel, thank you very much for joining us on World AIDS Day 2013 and for your support of our worldwide broadcast. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. You are on World AIDS Day Worldwide and that was Dean Beck speaking with Bill Botel. Um, we have in the studio with us Professor Michael Kidd and if all's going well, Dr Peter Higgins on Skype. Are you there, Dr Peter Higgins? Higgins, thanks Matt. Yes, I am. Uh, great. Uh, yes, uh, now just hearing there from Bill and he's suggesting that TB is a little bit forgotten and education needs to be realistic and honest. I'll start with you, Michael. Are we, are we, have we dropped the ball on TB? Uh, in Australia, uh, I think so. And I think that we need to uh, increase our focus on TB, but particularly our contributions towards research around TB. One of the biggest problems with TB has been the lack of new uh, drugs and new treatments, which have been uh, haven't been developed to treat this condition as have for so many other conditions. And I think Australia has a, has a lot to contribute towards that um, part of the science, but also towards assisting our near neighbours in, uh, in their programs and in their tackling of the HIV TB uh, co-infection epidemic. Uh, now, Peter, you've done a lot of work in uh, Southeast Asia, particularly Vietnam, Indonesia and China. Uh, what have you seen in the area of HIV in those areas? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, well, HIV in the areas that I've been working has essentially been driven by people who inject drugs. So the epidemic really 
um, skyrocketed when I started working in the late 90s, especially in Vietnam where um, notifications amongst people who inject drugs were up to 70, 80 and 90 percent of some of the neighbourhoods where injecting drug users were being tested. Um, thankfully, those prevalence rates have um, reduced remarkably, not necessarily because of um, the numbers of injectors have dropped, but a lot of people who got infected very early on died fairly quickly um, before HIV medications and before international NGOs and governments and the Vietnamese government itself decided to put money into HIV treatment. Uh, we're going to uh, speak more about the Asia-Pacific region and how uh, HIV is being handled, and in particular um, tuberculosis and also a bit of hep C with the injecting drug users there. If you've got a question for Professor Michael Kidd or Dr Peter Higgs, now is the time to tweet either hashtag JoyWAD for World AIDS Day on Twitter or email us directly on air at joy.org.au. We'll be back with your comments and questions after these messages from our partners in this great global project. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. It's World AIDS Day Worldwide. It's 3.30 in Melbourne, 8.30 a.m. in Dubai, 12.30 in Singapore and 8.30 p.m. in the evening to Singapore. Hello to the world from Melbourne. We're continuing our exploration of AIDS 2014 and the theme is stepping up the pace and we're particularly looking at co-infection to do with tuberculosis and perhaps a bit of hep C as well. Um, now, Michael, starting with you, Bill was talking there about the challenges of responding to HIV in the Asia Pacific, um, geographic challenges, low population, very broad area to cover, poor terrain. How, do we, how are we able to address the issues across the Asia Pacific region? Well, I think that uh, many of the, the challenges in many of our near neighbour uh, countries are actually similar challenges to what we experience in Australia, because in Australia we have these, these dense groupings of, of population and then we have very distributed um, remote uh, based communities as well. So we need a variety of responses on, on how to get services uh, out to people. Bill talked a lot about uh, the importance of, of education and uh, targeted education uh, in communities is, is essential. But especially in remote communities, it's very important to have the community members themselves very engaged in addressing the challenges. Uh, and one of the things that I've noticed in the work that I've done in, uh, in some of our near neighbour countries is how powerful uh, many of the women in communities can be who take responsibility for initiating some of these programs, for supporting the health workers who come into the area uh, to roll out the testing and treatment programs uh, and, uh, and provide a lot of um, the motivation for people to come in and get tested, get treated, get supported. Uh, and you know, often, the, particularly with HIV, um, the first target can be uh, towards women who are, are pregnant uh, and, uh, and getting tested and treated because we can prevent transmission of HIV to their unborn uh, child. Um, but, uh, and then often, as you see women getting better, uh, the men start to, to come in as well and, uh, and you get that response. Uh, I think that um, also it is really important that, uh, that we have strong support for the health services uh, in all these areas across our, our near neighbours because we need centres where the testing and treatment can take place. You know, the, the testing and treatment of HIV and of tuberculosis, these are long-term uh, issues and it's not just you know a single visit to a doctor or a single visit to a community nurse. This is continuing treatment, especially with tuberculosis which requires daily treatment which is often directly observed by uh, the healthcare provider, so the nurse will actually watch you take your medication each day uh, to make sure that you're, you are taking it and to make sure therefore that you're not at risk of having the TB uh, take over and, uh, or of having uh, the development of resistant strains of TB which then can be incredibly difficult uh, to treat and of course may be a risk not only to you as the person with HIV and TB but also to other people who you may um, inadvertently affect. Uh, now, Peter, you deal with, uh, you have an added challenge in the people that you're dealing with in your research, which is uh, stigmatisation to do with injecting drug use. How do we address that challenge in terms yeah. of education? I think, well, I mean, yeah, it is, it's a massive challenge, but I think, as Michael kind of points out, the, the opportunity to do daily observed therapy, for example, that is happening with tuberculosis can also happen with pharmacotherapy for opiate treatment. 
So programs like methadone programs or buprenorphine programs where people who do have opiate dependencies can go and see someone every day. They can also um, get their treatment if they are TB infected. One of the things that I've really noticed once people are starting to take their HIV medications is that they're starting to get very sick with hepatitis C. We know that amongst people who've got HIV from injecting drug use, almost 100% of them are also co-infected with, um, with hepatitis C. And the treatment for hepatitis C, whilst it is a very exciting area that is making huge inroads um, at the moment, in the next two years, we'll see some really dramatic impacts in relation to hepatitis C. But um, that's not going to filter down really quickly to um, communities that can't afford it because it is going to be extremely expensive. Uh, is there, Peter, is there political support to make those changes? I mean, injecting drug users are, are traditionally something that politicians don't like to speak about. Yeah. Is there a political will to address trans transmission through inje injecting drug use? No, I think, I mean, there's some real limitations. People who may have heard the broadcast this morning, Dean, who was um, disclosing his HIV status as a result of injecting drug use was really talking a lot about stigma um, in the Australian community. You can multiply that numerous times in a country like Vietnam or China where people are being still killed for um, being drug users. They're being mandatorily detained. Um, so the, the sorts of issues that you, you mention around stigma and discrimination are just enormous for, for people to come out and to be open about their, um, their drug use. Now we're getting uh, tweets coming in as well, uh, some comments about the broadcast. Katie P says she's gobsmacked at just and so impressed with lots of O's uh, at Joy 94.9's 24-hour live broadcast. Great work by the incredible team. And uh, Robert, let's embrace love, compassion, kindness and care on this World AIDS Day. So uh, uh, this message is really filtering out all around the world. Uh, mm. Now, Australia is in this enviable position of having some of the lowest rates. Is our contribution to the Pacific, um, is that just out of duty that we need to do this or is there something in it for Australia, Michael? Well, I, I think you've touched on a very interesting issue. I think that, uh, that Australia does have a responsibility to, uh, to the rest of the world. We are a wealthy country and I think that we do have a responsibility to support uh, global health initiatives and uh, particularly in our near neighbours. But uh, the, there is also uh, risks for Australia if we have expanding epidemics of infectious diseases in our near neighbours. So, for example, um, in the Torres Strait region at the very top of uh, Queensland, the region between uh, the tip of Australia and Papua New Guinea, uh, we have a, a fluid um, uh, border uh, for many of the Torres Strait Islander people and the, and the people of PNG on the other side of that border. And, uh, and Papua New Guinea has a, a much worse HIV epidemic and very significant uh, TB uh, co-infection problems. And, uh, and there is the potential risk of, of tuberculosis um, coming across the border, affecting people in the Torres uh, Strait and then affecting other parts of Australia as well. Uh, I think the other, uh, the other big area is uh, Australians love to travel. You know, we're, we're a community that... Um, is, uh, is forever on the move, and lots of young Australians go and spend time in our near neighbours, in it's Bali, right, right Indonesia. Passage, really, isn't it? It, yeah. is a, it is a rite of passage, and uh, some of that is for, uh, for enjoyment and for holidays, but some of that is to make a contribution through working with, um, with aid agencies and working to support uh, communities in our near neighbours. Now, you know, our, our, therefore our young people, when they, when they travel, are at risk of some of these infectious diseases are becoming exposed uh, to them. Now, you know, HIV obviously is transmitted through sexual contact, through sharing of, of needles, through exposure to uh, blood, uh, blood and other body fluids. But, uh, but tuberculosis is, uh, is even easier to catch. You only have to have someone cough on you when you're in a, in a, in a, uh, a bus or a, or a train or in a crowded mm. uh, area or across a table or wherever it might be. And, uh, and the potential is that you, you, know, you may pick up tuberculosis. So it's really important that we work together with our near neighbours and with the rest of the world in tackling these really serious health problems. Uh, Peter, the view while you've been overseas, uh, how do our neighbours see Australia's role in fighting HIV, TB and Hep C? Well, I think, I mean, they are really, I mean, impressed with the, I guess, ability we've had to do that. And 
some of that really stems my work in Vietnam came I got invited to do some work around peer education for people who inject drugs because of the work that I've been doing here in Australia with Vietnamese people and I guess we were really concerned about Vietnamese families who were sending their kids back to Vietnam to get away from the heroin scene here in Australia and I know that there were dozens of young people who were going back to hang out in Vietnam and a number of those people actually became exposed to HIV through their injecting drug use in Vietnam that they wouldn't have got if they hadn't have been sent back there and there's been an enormous amount of work done in the Vietnamese community here around that issue in the last 15 years or so. So whilst um, Vietnam kind of recognises our expertise in that area, there's certainly not necessarily that same amount of understanding in what's going on in relation to the changes that have occurred in Vietnam in the last 20 years. Now we've had a question through uh, at uh, onair at joy.org.au. You can send your questions. A uh, question to Professor Michael Kidd. What is the most vulnerable group of LGBT people to HIV? And do you think that young people are na naive about HIV AIDS because of recent drug therapies? Hmm. Great question. So mm. thank, thank you for that. <clears throat> Clearly, uh, in, in Australia, the most vulnerable group are still men who have sex with men. And, uh, and we're particularly concerned about uh, young uh, gay men who start having sexual uh, sexual relations and uh, who may not have had great education about safe sex and about protecting themselves against HIV. I think uh, one of the interesting things we saw this year was that um, over the past 12 months there's been a rise in the reported uh, number of cases of HIV in Australia and uh, and it's things went down and now they're starting to trend back back up again and it does appear from some of the social research which is being carried out that there there is a degree of complacency among some people about HIV you've got to remember for a lot of young people um, they uh, in Australia they've they haven't been around at the time when so many people were dying of HIV in this country. You know, since 1996, we've had effective therapies and HIV has become a chronic manageable condition. But it's still a very serious disease and it still has a serious impact on people's immune system and it requires uh, medication and it's daily medication probably for the rest of people's lives with all the uh, side effects that come with, uh, with being on treatment. Uh, and the challenges of having to take medication every day for the rest of your life. This is not something that, that somebody uh, w should expose themselves to uh, not knowing what, what the risks are. So, uh, so we're very concerned there. Now, of course, around the world, though, the, the HIV epidemic is different. And uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and many of our near neighbours, um, anyone who's having sexual uh, intercourse, whether they're heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, are, are at risk uh, as the people who are injecting drugs. Now, um, Peter, back to you, injecting drug users. I mean, that's something that Australia really, uh, it, it, it didn't really have an impact in terms of transmissions of, of HIV, certainly in the 80s and 90s. Um, are you noticing a change? I know you've, you, you've done a research into uh, injecting drug users around the Footscray area of Melbourne. Um, yeah. Are you seeing some sort of change in that area? Well, I mean, Australia has been done a tremendous job in relation to HIV amongst their injectors, primarily because we got needle and syringe programs up and running before HIV became a big problem in the injecting drug user community. Um, we know that, I mean, needles and syringes are the key tool to prevent transmission amongst people who inject drugs. Um, but because um, prevalence for hepatitis C was already up around 50, 60, 70 percent before NSPs got put in place in the mid to late 1980s, um, transmission continues to this day. So we know that a small number of sharing events um, puts your risk of being exposed to hepatitis C. Um, it's, it's very high, whereas the sharing amongst um, HIV positive injectors, there's so few of them that it's unlikely for you to become infected in that way. Um, so I guess, I mean, we're, we still have to keep up the, uh, the struggle to, to get sterile and um, enough injecting equipment out to people through um, health services, through community services, through um, pharmacies, but, um, and just ensuring that people know where to go to be able to get that equipment. Uh, Peter, those strategies, are, are, I guess you have to take a different tack in order to get through... Uh, the safe behaviour message to an injecting drug user that you would do to 
other high or at-risk groups. Um, how do you do that? How do you get cut through? Um, I mean, to be honest, I think injectors themselves know very clearly they don't like sharing injecting equipment. If you, if they had a choice to, you know, use a sterile needle and syringe rather than a used one, then they'll always choose the sterile one. So it, it really is about access rather than, I mean, I think education, we've done enough of that, to be honest. Um, it's about ensuring that people have got enough equipment um, to be able to not put themselves in a position where they are having to use someone else's syringe. Now, thinking, um, Michael, about priorities, uh, you are on the Ministerial Advisory Committee, so you advise the government on all sorts of things to do with uh, bloodborne viruses. Um, how do you, you heard Bill saying there that, you know, we don't need more fighter jets. How do you keep HIV and uh, other infections at the top of the priority change? How do we keep things at the top of the at the top of the uh, of the agenda is is a really important challenge. And I think that one of the areas in which Australia has been incredibly effective in tackling HIV has been through education. So our broad community education and the work which you're doing today is a fantastic example of that. But also targeted education at particular at-risk groups or groups of people. Uh, who may be vulnerable uh, to, to HIV infection. And we've been very effective in that as well. Uh, targeted education, particularly involving peers, uh, working with gay men, men who have sex with men, working with injecting drug users, working with our sex worker communities, uh, working with um, many of our uh, migrant communities which have come to Australia. Uh, has been very effective. The other, the other way that we can uh, do a lot more though is through increasing testing. For HIV, and we've seen a definite fall off in HIV testing across Australia among people who are at risk uh, over the past decade, and we need to uh, reinvigorate testing. Now, we can do that in a number of ways. We have new ways of uh, carrying out testing through rapid tests, which can be carried out and provide yep. people with, with a result very quickly. Now, rapid testing, which has been around in the world for about 10 years, has barely scratched the surface here in Australia. What, what's what's going wrong there? It's starting to scratch. Right. And, uh, but mainly, main, you're quite right, but mainly through uh, programs being run uh, und as uh, as research activities through a number of the, uh, the, the large clinics in the major cities in Australia. So we're starting to get that rapid testing available. Uh, there, are, there are some challenges with the, uh, with the, the tests themselves. Um, we uh, we want to make sure with any tests which are introduced into Australia that they're tests which if somebody is HIV positive, it's going to give us a positive result. It's not going to give us a falsely uh, negative result or it's not going to uh, give someone who is HIV negative a falsely positive result. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are some of the challenges. Uh, there, are, there are challenges in the way that, um, uh, that the tests are carried out. Uh, in some countries you can buy these tests uh, over the counter at uh, local chemist's shop or a drug like a store. pregnancy test type thing, yeah. Similar to, similar to pregnancy tests uh, in Australia, that's, uh, that's not currently uh, the, uh, the answer. Now, partly it's not the answer because we do have a very effective universal health care system where people have access to, uh, to highly trained uh, doctors and nurses through general practice and through our sexual health uh, services and Aboriginal community controlled uh, health organisations across the country, which is different to some other parts of the, uh, parts of the world. But I'd definitely like to see uh, an increased um, rollout of, uh, of rapid testing in Australia and, and more access because I think it is going to turn around um, uh, attitudes towards HIV testing in this country. Uh, Peter, rapid testing in the Asia region, have you, have you, is oh, there any evidence yeah. of that? Um, to be honest, it's not something I'm really across, but the um, ability to have primary healthcare services that are targeted at certain populations and, for example, injecting drug users. So in Victoria, we're really fortunate to have in Melbourne five um, funded health services that are specifically set up to work with people who inject drugs. So they're giving, I guess, spaces for people to come in. And I know that there is a regular amount of HIV testing that is done through those services. So by providing um, ancillary services like needle and syringe programs onto um, health, primary health care services for injecting drug users is a really important way of ensuring that we do um, get people tested regularly. Um, research, as Michael kind of points out, is another important 
way to do that and we've got a couple of cohorts that we're working in mainly looking at hepatitis C but we also do screening for um, HIV and we also vaccinate for hepatitis B so being able to add value to I guess research participants that they're not just being exploited for their uh, information but they're also being able to offer them opportunities to, um, to deal with their health issues is really essential. So on the, on the hep C front, are there wide-ranging programs being implemented or is it still at the uh, research test phase? Uh, yeah, no, for the new treatments, are uh, very much at that very new, um, exciting kind of stage. And there's certainly, um, as I kind of mentioned before, the next two years are really going to take off in relation to that. We look like we're going to have treatments that are eight weeks instead of 48 weeks, one pill instead of an injection with a really... Um, debilitating drug like interferon which the side effects are quite enormous for people it is, I mean this next little while our big problem will be how we get them out there and who's going to to fund them and how that's going to kind of roll out in a in a big enough way because they will be able to be offered through general practice settings through pharmacy settings it's I mean working with drug users themselves about how they want to get access to treatments is going to be an important part of that but I, I just can't believe the developments that have gone on in the last couple of years. Listening to all the interviews that have been going on today, there seems to be a genuine sense of um, excitement that we're at a tipping point, that um, we've made progress, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, not necessarily a cure, but a, a change in direction of HIV, taking, I guess, out Australia's uh, increases, recent increases. Uh, do you share that sense? I share that sense of optimism, absolutely. And uh, we saw this at the the last World uh, AIDS Conference with uh, discussions ar about moving towards an AIDS-free generation where no child needed to be born with HIV. We'd, we'd screen and, and treat uh, mothers where people w who were infected with HIV would get onto effective treatments early and therefore not uh, develop AIDS and develop the other uh, serious consequences of this disease. And, uh, and I think we're going to, it's going to be very exciting when the World AIDS Conference comes here to Melbourne um, next July. We're going to hear about what's happening around the world and about the changes which have occurred within that two-year intervening period. So it is an exciting time, but it's also a time where we need to still pay really close attention to the public health issues. We need to continue to have that edu those education programs rolling out. We need to continue to strengthen the testing and treatment. And Peter, what's your vision for uh, HIV and injecting drug yeah. use in the Asia Pacific? Well, I guess, I mean, for me, there are just so many people who are becoming infected and getting access to good health services in those countries is just not necessarily on, on the political agenda. So, I mean, the role of international NGOs, the Global Fund is going to be essential and to keep up the momentum in relation to funding in that way is going to be essential if we're expecting for um, HIV to be put under any sort of control, I guess, in um, countries, especially like Vietnam and China, where there are just the populations are just enormous and the, the vulnerability of the the communities who are living with HIV is just um, is so huge. Uh, a really quick answer, Michael. We've had a tweet come in. Uh, is de decriminalisation of sex work important for the region? Absolutely. Wonderful. Uh, this is uh, World AIDS Day worldwide here on Joy 94.9. We are stepping up the pace in this section. A huge thank you to our guest, Bill Botel, from the Executive Director of Pacific Friends of the Global Fund. Dr Peter Higgs here sitting with me, uh, uh, sorry, on the Skype from the National Drug Research Institute at Curtin University and Professor Michael Kidd here in the studio, the Chair of the Government Ministerial Advisory Committee on Bloodborne Viruses and Sexually Transmitted Infections. That's quite a title. It is. Um, <laughs> what a, a quick thank you too to all the team behind the scenes. There's people all over the place here today. We're broadcasting not just radio but video. Uh, great work, guys. Stick around. We are looking at where we are heading with James Findlay.